Okay, 20 minute timer. And voice recording, just in case. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to talk about paint and pigments. It's very important to know about watercolor paint so you know how the pigment acts when you're mixing and what you're actually doing with the colors. So I'll start with the palette. This is a really small metal palette that I use for travel and it has cakes in it. These are half pans and you can either buy the palette as a set with paints already in or you can buy empty cakes and fill them yourself from tubes. This is a Schminky brand watercolor paint and these are full size pans and I also added some smaller ones in the middle. And I actually like metal um, palettes the best because that's just what I started using right away and I've been using it ever since. This is a cheap plastic palette which works really well because what do you want to look for in a palette? Separate containers to add clean paint colors, a large mixing area to mix your colors. And here it has a thumb or whatever to hold it so obviously it's not waterproof. I still take these with me. These aren't leak proof either. I still take these with me outdoors and just put it in as a plump bag. So I did get one that is leak proof and this is Mission. Also good slots for clean colors, large mixing area. I like it a little bit less than the other palettes because it is leak proof actually so when I close the lid the paint inside doesn't dry and it streaks all over the place basically and then um, obviously none of my palettes are clean on purpose I always leave the leftover paint because I can use that paint for my later color mixtures why wash away perfectly good pigment and paint so I actually never Clean my palette and I recommend you don't either. Obviously, if you need to mix a really clean, bright color, you can take a paper towel and just clean off one area and continue mixing as you go along. So, okay, so what is the difference between cake colors and tube colors? Tube colors come out wet, obviously, and there is usually an agent added to the tube to keep the color wet inside. I think it's glycerin. Cake colors are dry, and I usually just pre-wet them with a little bit of water or brush before I start painting, so the um, water soaks in and they get nice and juicy. Um, the What is paint, basically? Paint is color dust particles floating in binder. So if you imagine a puddle of liquid and in that liquid are colored particles floating around pigment. So what happens is light enters these puddles of pigment, bounces around, gets to the white page and then bounces back up to your eyes and that's how we see color very basically. Um, the, bind, the difference between paint, oil paint, watercolor paint, acrylic paint, is the binder. The binder is what holds the pigment together and adheres it to the page or canvas. So the binder in the case of watercolor paints is gum arabic. Gum arabic is basically sap from acacia trees. The binder in oil paint is oil, linseed oil, walnut oil, even safflower oil and what is used to dilute that oil paint is a solvent, usually terpenoid, or a mixture of um, oil and terp, or just terp, or just oil. Uh, watercolor paints, we use water to dilute the paint. That's why it's so accessible, because you don't need a lot of stuff to get going. The audio is not so good on the camera. so. Pigment information is really important in watercolor paint or 
any paint actually. What is the telltale sign of better tube of paint versus worse tube of paint is the really, really cheap paints, and I'm talking about like 10 tubes in a box for 10 bucks. Don't buy those, they will be impossible to work with. Don't even have the pigment information on the tube or the specific color information. Each tube of paint has pigment listed on the back. So for example, this is lemon yellow, which is a cool yellow, and it's PY3, which is primary yellow 3. Ultramarine blue is PB29. Primary blue 29, and uh, let's see what else. Raw umber is PBR7. Primary brown 7. <laughs> anyway, there are a lot of single pigments, like the ones I just talked about, and a mixture of pigments in the same tube. This, you don't really need a lot of paint to get going. I have a basic palette of colors, 8 or 10 colors, that I have been using for over 15 years, and I can basically mix any color I need. If I have a specific color idea for like neon or really bright pink, then I might go out and mix that color because those neon colors are actually the only ones impossible to mix. But my basic palette stays the same. And if you are looking at paints and you're like, oh, I really like this super easy green Windsor, I really want to buy it. But then you look on the back and you can see that you might already have those colors by the pigments listed on the back, so you can easily mix your own. Another important thing to note is if you, for example, like a specific viridian green, like this one is from Saint-Lier, and it's PG-18 and PG-7. PG-18 is the pure viridian green, but in this case Saint-Lier added PG-7, which is thalo green, so if you get Viridian Green from another brand, it might look and act slightly differently. You want to predict the, the tinting strength and the action of each color, so you can mix the colors you need. Another one, this one, says Hue. Whenever it says Hue, you want to avoid it if you can, because it is a mixture of colors to make it look like the color it's supposed to. This is actually PG7, which is thalo green, so the label is misleading. It's not viridian, it's thalo green, so it's going to act and look slightly differently from actual viridian. And thalo green is a color that gets all over the palette and it might make, it will make your paintings have a green sheen to it and get into every color you mix. So you really want to be careful with that. Another color that is uh, really high tinting strength and can get all over your painting is burnt sienna and it's quite transparent. So pigment information on each tube so you can have, uh, you can make really good choices about which colors to mix, which colors to buy. Um, and some paints I don't know if I mentioned this already. The Seigneur paints have honey added to it. Some other paints add honey, like the American brand M. Graham have honey to, in their paints. It just uh, has better viscosity and texture of the paint, and some people have expressed the concern that when they paint with uh, paints that have honey in it, they, they can um, attract bugs and stuff to their painting. That has never happened to me, I don't believe it's true, and I've actually spoken to Seigneur about the issue, and they said they have never experienced the problem, and that all their paints are super high quality. Okay, so in your palette, you need a warm and a cool of each color. So, a cool yellow will be a lemon yellow. Lemon yellow is cool because it has more green in it, and it's towards the cooler colors on the color wheel, and then a warm yellow, like cadmium yellow, has more red in it, or Indian yellow also has more red in it, so it is uh, towards the red spectrum on the color wheel, and you need a cool and a warm of each 
just so you can mix a variety of color. Because what is color? Tone, value, um, temperature. Well, I guess tone and value is really similar. But temperature of color. Is it bright? Is it light? Is it dark? Like temperature of daylight is pretty neutral. I can't remember how many degrees Kelvin, like 5,200 degrees. And as you turn on a light bulb, fluorescent light, all the colors are going to have a yellow tint to them. So sometimes when you paint at night, you have to be careful that your um, color mixing thoughts aren't influenced by artificial light. So they do have um, daylight light bulbs out there, if that's a huge concern. I think I found one at Ikea, even. Okay, so back to color, for example, and also light fastness of colors. Color fades under light and sunlight. So they have a color fastness, light fastness, sorry, for each color. And one is usually really good, I think, and when it gets to four, it's a low light fastness, so it's going to fade. Some colors are known to be fugitive. Fugitive means it'll disappear over time. Alizarin crimson is fugitive, so if you get alizarin crimson permanence, I think it's a mixture of other pigments that look and act like alizarin crimson. Again, this is hue, alizarin crimson hue, and it has PR206, so it's probably carmine. And there's a really good website, handprint.com, where you can look up each pigment for each color and it's really useful. For example, if I want to get a really specific green, I can mix it on my own or I can get a single pigment color to add to my color palette. So on my color palette, I have cool yellow, warm yellow, which is lemon yellow is cool, cadmium yellow is warm. Then a neutral, like yellow ochre or raw sienna, you don't need both. Basically, each color serves a function on the palette. So you only need one color to serve one function. You don't need multiple similar colors. So the yellow serves a function. You can have Indian yellow instead of cadmium yellow deep I have. Indian yellow is also very warm and I like it very much. Instead of lemon yellow, you can have Hansa yellow, which is a cheaper pigment mixture than cadmium colors, but it still has a cool, uh, it's a cool color. Yellow ochre, raw sienna, very similar. What is raw sienna? Dirt they dug up from sienna. <laughs> what is burnt sienna? Dirt they dug up from sienna and put it in the oven. Then you need a cool red, which will be a lizard crimson, Cool colors are also quite useful for mixing those deep darks and or instead of alizarin crimson if you're concerned about the permanence of it you can use carmine, quinacridone is quite popular, quinacridone rose, quinacridone violet, then you need a warm red. Here I think cadmium red is indispensable and I usually get cadmium red medium. This is cadmium red hue, so again it's fake, it's not actual cadmium red. I'm looking for the, there's no way I can read this, it's so small. Okay, so it has R line yellow, which is PY65, parole red, which is a cool red actually, and another yellow. So this is not real cadmium red, it's just a bunch of other reds and yellows. Maybe you could even mix those based on your color selections. After the red, we need burnt sienna, another earth color. And the pigment for this one is PBR7. A really nice color. I really like cool blues, so cerulean blue is a really good go-to. I usually use it in my oil colors. It's one of my favorites, but in watercolor, I don't think it's so useful because to have a lighter blue, you can just add water and it doesn't affect the, it doesn't make the color pasty or whitish as if you were to add white paint. So instead of cerulean blue for the cool blue, in watercolor set, I would get Prussian blue, which is PB set 27 
or Thalo Blue, which I don't have here, but with Thalo Blue, you can, you have to be very careful because it's very strong and it affects everything around it. You, you might not even need a cool blue, you can have a really limited palette because the green, the viridian green, which is, serves the function of a dark cool color, can also actually be used to mix with blue to make your French ultramarine cooler. So you can actually get away with not having a cool blue at all. The warm blue, of course, is ultramarine, which is PP29, and I think that's the color that I go through the most. They also have cool and warmer versions of ultramarine blue. I don't think it matters that much. Then, just for fun, raw umber, because again, you can mix really nice neutrals with raw umber, and raw umber is a cooler brown, and it's not a fugitive color like Van Dyke brown. Van Dyke brown is another really nice cool brown, but it's a fugitive color, so it fades. So blue, brown, green, that's it. That's basically it. So how many was that? Eight to 10 colors. For some, um, sometimes you want to have black, not to mix with the colors, but you can make really nice watercolor sketches with just black paint. And if you don't have black paint, you can actually use India ink. It's beautiful and it's a great way to get started without worrying about color mixing just yet and I will make a video about that also. So this is ivory black, used to be for, made from ground up bones, and it is uh, a cooler version than this black, which is lamp black, like fastness one, PBK9, and PY43, so primary yellow 43 added to this black. White, of course, is the classic titanium white PW6, so when you look for colors that you don't recognize the name of or that are hues, just see if there's white in it or not in the back because white will wash out color and it will make every color look like as if there's white in it because there is. So there are cooler whites like zinc white is cooler. Um, PW6 titanium white is warmer. It doesn't matter so much with watercolor about the white. Some people use it for accents. And I think really nice idea if you want to try out gouache, for example. This is literally gouache. This is not actual watercolor, the white. So any white you have in your sets, it's gouache. If you want to try out gouache without buying a set of gouache paints, just get a tube of white and mix it with the colors that you have and see if you like the look and feel of it. Now they also have acrylic gouache, which is acrylic paint made to look and act like actual gouache. So there's a difference between traditional gouache, which is watercolor with um, gum arabic binder and chalk, and acrylic gouache, which is a pigment in an acrylic polymer emulsion. Okay, so that's it for the pigments, and I can list down below the colors, the suggested colors in the palette, and that's what I have been using for many years, and that's what I recommend to my students. Um, and, okay, so, um, the cakes. The thing about the cakes is, the cake, if you want to get the cakes, they actually contain a lot more paint because the way they make cakes is they fill it with liquid paint, let it dry, the paint settles, and they fill it again, the paint settles and dries again, and then they fill it again. This is important if you're, if you want to estimate how long a paint will last you before you have to repurchase. If you fill it from the tube, it'll last a much shorter time because it didn't go through the drying and settling process like a pre-manufactured cake. Okay, so that's it for the paints, I think. I might have forgotten something. I will just talk about it later on. For the brushes, uh, you only need one brush, at most two. So I have, these are brushes that I have from St. Petersburg very old and very nostalgic. 
And these are brushes that I purchased at the local store. I like them quite a bit. It's a round Princeton Aqua Elite. I like round brushes the best because if you wet it, the tip comes to a point and then you can use the side of the brush, which I will go over, to have flat washes. A really small brush you might need for really fine lines, but you can get away with a large brush. So I recommend, this is 20, the larger the number, the larger the brush. Maybe size 16, this is closer to a size 16, and a size 10 or 8, and that's it. And another reason I like having two brushes is because I can have one brush to mix all the warm colors so I don't have to wash it out so desperately each time and the second brush for all the cool colors and not have it intermix so much. Why? Okay, so the most important thing, watercolor is paper, which we already talked about, and brushes. You can get away with, you know, paint, a mixture of quality of paint, maybe brushes that are okay but really terrible brushes. What is the function of the brush? The brush has to pick up colored water and dispense it onto the surface, onto the paper. And with really cheap, cheap brushes, which are not manufactured for watercolor, the brush simply won't pick up enough liquid for you to efficiently make the painting. So you'll have to keep dipping and keep dipping and keep dipping and it will take longer and it'll be harder to paint because then after you kept picking up the pigment, the brush won't disperse the pigment onto the page in an efficient manner. And so that's the function of the brush which it has to serve. Pick up the liquid, place it on the paper. And you want the brush to bounce back when it hits the surface. You don't want it to um, hit the surface and then stay bent like this because it won't be able to paint again. And then you want the brush to come to a perfect point when wet. And you don't want the brush to lose hairs too much. So take care of the brushes that you do have. Wash them with soap and water and don't definitely don't let the paint dry onto the brush. Another thing which I found relatively recently is do not use your better watercolor brushes to paint with ink Be because ink coats each bristle and it ruins the brush. Just use really cheap brushes for ink like a Sumi brush or something similar. You want to keep your watercolor brushes clean. And another, um, this has to do with containers for water. You want two containers and large ones so you can have a cleaner water last longer. One container for just clean water that you will use to mix with your paints and a second container where you will rinse off your brush and the water will be dirtier. You don't want to dilute your paints with dirty water because that ruins the brightness of your colors. And that's really important. Okay, so containers, um, brushes, paints, and palette. Depending on whether you're using tube paints or pans. I usually start out with pans and then I refill as I go along. Okay, so I hope that was helpful and we will do some sketches with ink or black in the next video and if you have any questions, please let me know below. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for joining. See you later.